to the details. <coughs> However, before I get there, I want to talk about a couple of brief things about Stokes flow. I want to talk about, first of all, just generally what the Stokes flow equations are and a couple of different forms of those Stokes flow equations. I want to talk about one specific class of flows, which in fact historically has been not particularly relevant, uh, not used very much in mechanical or chemical engineering, but has really developed a resurgence in part because of the development of microfluidic devices, and those are Healy Shaw flows. <coughs> and then I want to basically hint at what some of the multipolar solutions will be for the Stokes flow equations. Again, we're not going to do this in great detail. We're not going to do Stokes flow solutions and multipolar solutions in detail until we start talking about particle transport. But I still want to introduce this to you so that you know what is coming. One of the key things that will be coming for Stokes flow is that we'll want to be able to describe different flows in terms of these multipolar solutions. And so we'll do an introduction to that today. But after today, we won't be dwelling on all of the details of Stokes flow as we could. Instead, we're going to start talking about the details of the electrical double layer. So that's the plan. OK. <coughs> These are the Navier Stokes equations. And as we've already discussed, these can be non dimensionalized. And when they're non-dimensionalized, we find that these first two terms have a relative magnitude that is one Reynolds number different from these two terms. So if we non-dimensionalize these, one form we can put these in for steady boundary conditions is this. When that is the case, and when the Reynolds number is relatively small, it becomes natural for us to neglect the terms on this left-hand side and say that in the limiting case where the Reynolds number approaches 0, that these terms will also both approach 0. This is a correct analytical approach only if the non-dimensionalization was performed property, properly such that all of these terms are of the same order, but for the pre-multiplier. <coughs> When we do, do that sort of analysis, we get the Stokes equations. Which look like this. And a key property of the Stokes equations is that they're linear. Because they're linear, that allows for superposition. Because they're linear, we tend to have only a, a very small set of situations where uh, they're nonlinear and unstable. <coughs> now, these Stokes equations. can come in a couple of different forms. And it's useful to put these equations in these three different forms, because each one has a different story to tell about these Stokes equations. And in particular, each one will be used analytically in different ways. And an easy way for us to put these Stokes equations in different forms is to take the divergence of both sides and to take the curl of both sides. You may recall when we talked about potential flow and we talked about the role of vorticity, we took the Navier-Stokes equations and we put them into a velocity-vorticity uh, form by taking the curl of both sides. So we're actually going to repeat that here for the Stokes equations. And we're also going to take the divergence of both sides. And again, these two different actions will take this one set of equations and put them in a second and third form. So if we take the curl of both sides, what happens when I take the curl of the gradient of p? I get 0. So the curl of the gradient of a scalar is equal to 0. What happens when I take the curl of the right-hand side? Yeah, I end up getting vorticity. Specifically, I get the Laplacian of vorticity. If I take the curl of this right-hand side, 
I have this expression. If I assume that the viscosity is a scalar, or if I assume that it is uh, uniform, then it comes out in front. And furthermore, the curl and the Laplacian operators commute with each other. And so I can say that the curl of the, of the Laplacian of U is equal to the Laplacian of the curl of U. When I perform those operations, I get this result. And because I already have a, a symbol for this expression, and because I can divide both sides by the vorticity, I can write this result in this form. And what this tells me is that in the case where the governing equation is the Stokes equations, here as I've written it, it has a pressure and a velocity. But if I want to eliminate that pressure, I can write this entirely in terms of the vorticity. The difference between these two, unlike before, when I put an equation entirely in terms of vorticity as a way of arguing that, in fact, oftentimes there was no vorticity in the flow, I don't get that benefit here. Because in these Stokes equations, generally, I will always have vorticity. However, what it does do is it lets me anticipate what boundary conditions I might be using to solve these equations. If I use this form, I have variables in terms of pressure and velocity. Naturally, I'm going to want to have boundary conditions in terms of pressure and velocity. Here, I have no pressure. And to solve this equation, I don't need pressure boundary conditions. And so this form is going to be the most useful. when I don't have boundary conditions for the pressure. <clears throat> now, as I said, I can also take these Stokes equations and I can put them into a different form by taking not the curl of both sides, but rather the, di the divergence. And when I take the divergence of the left-hand side, what do I get? I get the Laplacian of the pressure. Unlike before, when I took curl of grad, I got something very simple. I could just eliminate it. Here, I can't simplify this anymore. But the divergence of the gradient of p is the Laplacian. What do I get when I take the divergence of the right-hand side? I get 0. Why do I get 0? That's right. I can, the divergence and the Laplacian commute. So the divergence of Laplacian of u is equal to the Laplacian of the divergence of u. And the divergence of u for an incompressible flow is 0. So I have the Laplacian of 0, which is just 0. So these second and third forms basically show that I can take the Stokes flow equations and I can write them as Laplace equations here in terms of the scalar p, here in terms of the vector omega. And just as the version 2 that I have uh, on the upper right is convenient if I have no pressure boundary conditions, but I do have velocity boundary conditions, this one is the most usual, or is the most useful, if I don't have velocity information, but I do have pressure information. So these three versions of the Stokes equations are all valid, they're all correct, they're all equivalent, but they anticipate different sets of boundary conditions.